Great. All right. Well, it's eight o'clock, so why don't we get started? Welcome everybody to the Department of Medicine Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, this week we have a uh, special uh, outside speaker, um, Dr. Mike Mugavero from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. We'll be talking about the HIV epidemic, our other um, epidemic that's ongoing, and to do the introduction, our own Dr. G Jim Sossman. Jim? Great, thank you, Lynn. And uh, this is a special uh, Grand Rounds because December 1st was World AIDS Day. And although we've been a little distracted by that other global pandemic kind of in the room, uh, World AIDS Day is really a time uh, that we use to kind of reflect on our worldwide and national response to the epidemic. And we remember the millions that we've lost actually over now literally 40 years. Uh, in 1981, in December, uh, some articles came out, three publications came out in the New England Journal describing the syndrome that we would know as uh, HIV. Uh, and it's really a re double down on our achievements and pledge uh, to work in the future. So uh, today our speaker will be Dr. Michael Mugavera, who is a tenured professor of medicine, Division of Infectious Disease at uh, uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham uh, School of Medicine. And he is an ID and HIV specialist and a, re a real scholar in HIV related health services and outcome research, particularly in the area of uh, HIV care engagement. And you'll see how important uh, that is today. To give you a little bit of uh, Mike's uh, uh, formative stats and pedigree, he uh, went to school at the uh, University of Notre Dame where he graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa grad, then uh, went to Vanderbilt uh, University School of Medicine, graduated AOA, and did his residency and chief residency at UAB. He then went over to Duke for an ID fellowship and completed an AHRQ uh, uh, fellowship and got a master's for, through their clinical research training program. He then returned to UAB this time as an assistant prof and moved up the academic ladder to full professor. Along the way, has taken on a number of senior uh, critical leadership roles, including now as a director of UIB's Center for Clinical and Translational Science Training Academy. He's co-director of their Center for Outcomes and Effectiveness of Research and Education, and co-director of UIB's uh, CFAR, Center for AIDS Research. Likewise, over the past 10 years, He's received multiple UAB awards, recognizing his excellence in teaching research and mentorship, and not just once, but multiple times that same award. Uh, so he's really a, a star and uh, received a number of national awards, including IAPAC, which is the International Association of Providers of Aged Care Top 150, and the uh, HIV Research Award from the HIV Medical Association of IDSA. Uh, briefly regarding his academic and scholarly work, as I mentioned, he's a national leader in retention and care and really uh, discusses conceptual models, measurement and evidence informed interventions to enhance uh, uh, HIV care engagement. Uh, through this, he's co-authored uh, roughly probably now over 240 scientific publications include uh, uh, in addition to invited publications and book chapters, and he's got a wide portfolio of federal funding from the NIH versus CDC and some foundations. So with that, uh, uh, we're really honored to have uh, Dr. Mugavira provide this special grand rounds uh, titled Ending the HIVF, a paradigm for population health. Mike, take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm really sorry I can't be there with you all today. I um, also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that we are in the middle of the pandemic and, and all the folks who are on the front lines and doing work in the hospital in a number of capacities. So um, thanks to all of those who have really been in the trenches on the front lines doing the hard work of caring for those um, with COVID. Um, and again, an honor to be here with you today. And my, my goal is to 
focus on HIV and look at a bit of history around HIV and ask the question of, is this a paradigm that might be applied to population health in other areas? Um, so outline of the talk is broken up into three different sections. First is talking about this new plan for America, ending the HIV epidemic, give an overview of what that plan is, but also the origins. There's a lot of buildup to this plan. Going to talk then about ending HIV in Alabama. So over the last decade or so, some of the platform and relationships we've built and the progress we've made. Um, and then the last piece is to talk about this idea of a paradigm for population health. So, uh, and using, you know, I think very contemporaneously COVID-19 as a case study, but what are some of the lessons learned around the progress over the 40 years, um, as Jim mentioned, from 1981 um, in ending the HIV epidemic, and might they apply to other chronic diseases, thinking more broadly <clears throat> in other areas beyond HIV? So ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America. So in the State of the Union address, February 5th, 2019, a very long address, um, you know, but buried within that transcript towards the end of the talk, was the president saying his commitment to eliminate the HIV epidemic in the United States within 10 years, and that together we will defeat AIDS in America. So in that kind of a platform of a State of the Union address, you know, the president to announce this is a goal, this is a plan, incredibly powerful. Um, a very coordinated effort. So two days later, later in JAMA, an editorial from leaders across different DHHS agencies. So now commonly household names, Tony Fauci, Redfield, among others, really two days later after the State of the Union address, this editorial for the medical community saying, this is ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for the US. And then just a month later was the 2019 National HIV Prevention Conference. And I had the honor of co-chairing this conference, uh, Secretary Azar, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as well as the leaders of every agency were there and very consistently discussing this message about EHE, the plan for America, um, and really just a very coordinated effort. So in three months time, from the announcement to the medical community, to the scientific community, a really concerted organized effort. And the goals are incredibly ambitious. So the goals are to uh, reduce um, the number of new infections by 75% by 2025 and by 90% by 2030, and it's really built upon these four big pillars. So diagnosis through testing, treatment, so all persons who are living with HIV getting treatment rapidly to achieve viral suppression, prevention using proven modalities of biomedical prevention, and then responding to clusters. So there's oftentimes outbreaks and clusters of infection that can be identified and trying to identify and interrupt those clusters. I think critically importantly, and as part of this strategy is multiple agencies in the Department of Health and Human Services have been working together in a very coordinated collaborative fashion from day one. So HRSA, CDC, NIH, SAMHSA, Indian Health Service, all on board, all working together in a coordinated effort towards these shared goals around these four different pillars. And I, I pause here because sometimes talking with colleagues, um, you know, in medicine, there's this discussion about HIV exceptionalism. There's a lot of things that are unique about HIV that don't exist for other areas like diabetes or hypertension or stroke. Um, and, and I will point out that a lot of this kind of exceptionalism was born out of advocacy. And in those challenging early days of the 80s and 90s, when we did not have effective therapies um, and folks were dying at high rates, a sense of urgency. And out of that advocacy, a number of foundational programs that exist, you know, that have really been foundational to get to the ending the HIV epidemic are at the federal government level, <clears throat> excuse me, having a presidential advisory council on HIV AIDS. So a dedicated council of persons who are medical, non-medical, industry, public health, who are there, who convene regularly to advise, you know, the president's office on uh, matters pertaining to HIV AIDS, also an office of national AIDS policy. So at the federal level, a clear commitment towards having a national office focused on HIV policy and, and practice in the US. Clinically through HRSA, the Ryan White program. So Ryan White, who's pictured uh, a young man from Indiana, had hemophilia, acquired HIV by transfusion, faced incredible discrimination, uh, him and his family, uh, died before therapy became available, his mother became an incredibly strong advocate. And in his name and in his honor, the Ryan White program was started where as a payer of last resort, access to medical services, including medications, 
but also supportive services for things like housing and food insecurity, the critical social and structural determinants, um, a comprehensive, you know, plan and program to support the medical and supportive service needs of persons living with HIV. Critically, um, HRSA requires client level data reporting. So I think one of the key elements that makes some of the work possible in HIV is there is client level data available to really understand and measure what's happening, you know, both at an individual but population level and also the Ryan White program having an, a heavy emphasis on quality improvement and a quality improvement mandate. In the public health space, as with most or, you know, infectious diseases, there's CDC surveillance. I um, mean, again, coming back to the idea of data um, with individual level testing data, but also reporting of viral load data, there have been unique opportunities for measurement and monitoring at a population level, but also for moving from surveillance just to kind of generate composite data and reports to using those data for individual level data driven public health programs. And finally, the research infrastructure at NIH. So, I mean, beyond earmarks at each institute to support HIV work, there's also an incredibly robust clinical trials network. So, a, a strong infrastructure for prevention trials, for treatment trials. So, I think very important to acknowledge up front, there are unique aspects of HIV that do not exist for other chronic diseases. Um, also, that these were born out of advocacy and out of urgency. But I think as I go on, hopefully some of the principles and lessons learned from HIV, even absent some of these existing structures, um, might make a case for the lessons learned might apply to pop health in, in other areas and for other diseases. So we have to go back a full decade. So as I said, ending the HIV epidemic, you know, while announced at the State of the Union address was not necessarily, you know, born de novo. So going back to 2010, um, this is Jeff Crowley pictured with President Obama. Uh, Jeff was the director of the Office of National AIDS Policy, drafted the first ever national strategy um, for HIV AIDS for the United States in July of 2010. Um, and there was four key goals to reduce the number of new infections, to increase access to care and health outcomes, to reduce disparities and to achieve a more coordinated national response. Um, and oftentimes that fourth component isn't discussed as much. But again, coming back to EHE, you know, the coordination, you know, not only between agencies, so between CDC, NIH, SAMHSA, HRSA, Indian Health Service, but also within agencies, you know, oftentimes within agencies, there can be silos. So I think this idea of a more coordinated response so that the different agencies are working together around a shared plan was a really critical piece of the, the initial strategy. So after the strategy was released, there was a number of really uh, seminal studies that uh, in biomedical advances that really changed the HIV prevention and treatment landscape. So the first and, and kind of anchoring to the current EHE plan of prevent pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this was the landmark IPREX randomized control trial. And what this study was looking at was uh, a medication used to treat HIV, a, a single tablet combination pill taken once daily among men who have sex with men and what was shown was um, a, a dramatic reduction in the number of new persons acquiring HIV uh, infection. So the idea of taking a medication prophylactically to prevent acquiring HIV infection, a few years later, the FDA approved this medication for PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. Not surprisingly, I think as with all things in medicine, behavior fuels biology. So the efficacy is highly linked to adherence in a number of follow-up observational uh, studies and, and implementation type trials. And importantly, as we've moved forward over the years, the CDC's guide, guidelines for PrEP include not only men who have sex with men who still bear a higher burden of the HIV epidemic in the US, but also for heterosexual men and women, as well as persons who inject drugs. But this biomedical advance of PrEP was really a game changer and a really dynamic time right after the strategy to have the IPREX uh, findings published. The next major advance, just a short time later, was pre in prevention was treatment as prevention. So this was a landmark study, the HPTN052, and HPTN is the HIV Prevention Trials Network. As I said, you know, the, the strong investment from NIH to have a trial network. This was the 52nd study funded through this network. And I remember waking up on the morning of May 12th, getting my phone buzzing with the press releases from HPTN, from NIH. And what this study did was looked at persons who had a CD4 count that was above the threshold where treatment guidelines would say to start therapy. So normal practice would be to not start therapy. And the study said, let's either start therapy immediately 
or wait to start therapy until someone's CD4 count drops below the threshold where we would start treatment. And the study was among serodiscordant couples. So one partner was positive and living with HIV and one positive partner was negative. And what they found was in the immediate versus delayed arm, there was a 96% reduction in new HIV infections. And the mechanism was clear that with viral suppression in the a person living with HIV, starting therapy and suppressing virus, there was no sexual transmission of HIV. And I will pause to say, um, Tom Quinn in the New England Journal of Medicine ha actually showed us this in, in an observational trial of serodiscordant couples in Rakai. So there was a, a bunch of observational studies that showed us based upon viral load, the risk of transmission um, was lower with low viral load versus high viral load, but it took the randomized control trial um, to really get the attention of the you know, scientific community as well as the lay community. And we saw with science, this was heralded as the breakthrough of the year, treatment as prevention, and even the economist saying, does task, does treatment as prevention, you know, indicate that we're approaching the end of AIDS? And then there was a very sobering report published. So Ed Gardner and colleagues, first in clinical infectious diseases, followed by Cohen et al. from the CDC, this idea of the treatment cascade. And what was looked at was among the number of persons who are living with HIV in the United States, how many were diagnosed? How many were then linked to care, retained in care, uh, on treatment, antiretroviral therapy, and achieving viral suppression? And the sobering findings were, so we learned from TASP, with viral suppression, there is no sexual transmission of HIV, but only 20 to 30 percent of all persons living with HIV in the U.S. were estimated to have achieved viral suppression. And the real gaps were that 20 percent of persons living with HIV were undiagnosed, so had not yet been reached by testing. And the other major gap was that roughly half of persons who were diagnosed and living with HIV were not engaged in regular medical care. So either failed to link to care or failed to be retained in care. So really highlighting while TASP, we have the scientific evidence that treatment as prevention works and thinking about contemporaneously the idea of herd immunity, if this is really gonna work as a prevention strategy, we have to dramatically increase the number of persons living with HIV who have achieved viral suppression to really achieve the population health benefits of viral suppression. And so if we fast forward and look at HIV transmissions across this treatment cascade or care continuum in 2016, you can see kind of the different steps on that cascade of care, but then in the table, we've made some progress. So the numbers are down to where only 15% of persons in the US living with HIV are unaware of their infection, but that 15% are estimated to account for 38% of new HIV transmissions and new infections in 2016. Um, the number dropped from 50 to 23 percent of persons estimated to have been diagnosed with HIV but not be in care, but that 23 percent of individuals accounting for 43 percent of new infections. So still, as with that previous cascade, the uh, individuals who are undiagnosed and unaware and those living with HIV who are diagnosed but not in care, accounting for the overwhelming majority, over 80 percent of new infections. Also importantly, an increase to 51% of persons who are now virally suppressed. So dramatic improvement from those earlier estimates of between 20 and 30%. And also critically importantly, as we learned from um, the HPTN study, zero new infections. So among persons living with HIV who have achieved and sustained viral suppression um, cannot sexually transmit the virus. And I think this has been an important finding and it's been taken on by the community and, and advocacy has always been such an important part of um, the progress in HIV. And through a community led effort by the prevention access group, a campaign called U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. So the prevention action group really advocating just the importance for the sexual health of persons living with HIV faced with so much stigma, so much fear, what an empowering message to say by being on therapy and controlling your virus, you cannot sexually transmit HIV to sexual partners. So it was uh, a brave um, report, a dear provider letter from the CDC leaders, John L. Merman and Eugene McRae in September of 2017, that really put out there and for the CDC to say, persons living with HIV who maintain viral suppression cannot transmit HIV sexually. Uh, a very bold and provocative and important statement from the CDC 
that was rapidly followed by states like New York, cities like Chicago, <laughs> other areas really endorsing and taking on this U equals U campaign uh, as a way of, again, I think empowering and acknowledging and trying to reduce stigma among persons living with HIV around their sexual health. So beyond the prevention benefits of sustained viral suppression, um, really important treatment benefits of sustained viral suppression. So this study goes back several years. Uh, on the left of the slide is the SMART study, which is the Strategic Management of Antiretroviral Therapy, a randomized control trial conducted from 2002 to 06 that enrolled uh, uh, 5,500 roughly individuals. Um, and what they, they did at this time was um, uh, looked at a CD4 guided strategy. So, you know, historically, uh, our therapy and our recommendations around antiretroviral treatment were based upon CD4 counts. So the idea was until you fall below a threshold, not to start therapy. That's changed now for many, many years. You know, it's been the guidance of offering therapy as soon as someone is aware and, and if they're willing and, and ready to take treatment. But back then, the idea was, can we conserve therapy, reduce exposure to medicines that were more toxic at the time by saying someone will be on treatment for a period of time as their CD4 count gets high enough, we will stop therapy and give a drug holiday, monitor them, keep a close eye, checking CD4, checking on them clinically. And once the CD4 falls below a threshold, not you know an AIDS defining threshold, but a higher level, we'll restart therapy. So strategically made sense. Now what they found out by the DSMB was there was an increased mortality in the drug conservation group versus the viral suppression group. So those who stayed on therapy had consistent viral suppression, had lower mortality. Through a series of, of additional studies, translational studies, you know, it seemed the mechanism was with intermittent viremia, there was inflammation and immune activation. So ongoing viremia fueling inflammation, immune activation that was driving this higher mortality. Interestingly, the higher mortality was not from AIDS events. It was from non-AIDS events, again, attributed to this kind of inflammatory state and immune activation state uh, when folks were not on treatment. Um, we did a study in the Scenix cohort. So Scenix is a CIFAR cohort. There are eight different sites nationally distributed, um, and it's an observational clinical cohort study. Looked at folks who were initiating therapy um, between 2000 and 2008, roughly 2000 individuals. And what we did was made a calculation called viremia copy year. So think about smoking and smoking pack years. So we've gotten viral loads clinically um, over time and looked at the first value, the six month value. So is it cross sectionally the most recent value? Have used the kind of viral load as a cross sectional measure to help guide our therapy and guide our thinking. So the idea was if we take an individual's viral load curve and connect the dots and can estimate an area under the curve using the trapezoidal rule, we can estimate similar to smoking pack years, what is someone's cumulative viral exposure? So I know they might be suppressed today, but how about last year and the year before? So the idea of cumulative exposure to virus. And what we found was that the cumulative viremia copy years was associated with increased mortality. So the Kaplan-Meier plot is showing this kind of time updated viremia copy years the lowest dotted line being the highest level, the dashed line, the intermediate, the, the, the solid line, the lowest level, but clearly showing with more accumulated um, a viral exposure, higher mortality. A really important finding from this study was that when we controlled for CD4 count, there was an effect and an increased mortality with viremia copy years independent of CD4. So I think similar to the SMART trial, this increased mortality is not fueled solely by reductions in CD4 and AIDS defining events, but the idea that there is something with ongoing viremia and cumulative exposure to virus that increases morbidity and mortality among persons living with HIV. But really over the years, because historically there wasn't as strong of a push for sustained suppression, now we say both for prevention, but also for individual health outcomes, sustaining viral suppression is really a key goal of treatment. So the national strategy was updated uh, in 2015, updated through 2020. And Doug Brooks had replaced Jeff Crowley as the uh, ONAP, the Office of National AIDS Policy Director. And I think to Doug's credit, you know, he was he did a bunch of listening sessions and traveled around and he articulated this vision. This was the same exact vision in the initial strategy of 2010. So there was consistency here. Doug said, you know, the, the vision that was articulated in the first draft was a good vision. 
I don't need to come in and change that. You know, let's have some consistency. Let's have some continuity. So I think really to Doug's credit, despite being a new person drafting this new policy said, I'm going to maintain this vision because this vision still makes sense. And I think for us in the community, I'm um, doing the work. It also was grounding because we're still pulling in the same direction, focused in the same way. There's really no confusion or ambiguity. Doug also, I think with his team articulated, here are the pillars, here are the goals. So widespread testing and linkage to care. We had had the IPREC study, so full access to PrEP services, broad support for persons living with HIV to stay engaged in care and achieve universal viral suppression. So if we pause and go back to the earliest slides about the ending HIV epidemic, it's the same pillars. It's the same exact pillars, testing, prevention with PrEP, treatment to achieve universal viral suppression, while there wasn't the goal of respond, everything else is exactly the same. So really we have incredible consistency, incredible continuity in terms of where the goals are, how we're gonna do this and how we're gonna get there. I think a powerful visual for me, so, so the treatment cascade was incredibly powerful and it really mobilized the research, clinical, treatment, advocacy, policy communities People had written those numbers, but now we had a visual to kind of rally around. This idea of a status neutral continuum, I think was equally powerful. So not just focusing on the, the uh, persons living with HIV, moving through a series of steps to achieve viral suppression, but those not living with HIV and their prevention uh, cascade. So the idea of testing being the gateway, we've got a screen and test, but then among folks who test positive, moving to the right, on a treatment cascade, but individuals who test negative moving to the left on a prevention continuum. So, and we can situate on that these different pillars of testing, prevention, and universal suppression. And again, I think this framework of a status neutral continuum isn't unique to HIV. If you're focusing on diabetes or hypertension or other chronic you know, diseases, the idea of screening is the gateway. Screen is, is the access point. And among for persons who screen positive, moving down a pathway to appropriately treat and manage that condition. But I think equally importantly, among persons who test negative, <clears throat> thinking about linking up to prevention services and prevention opportunities. So in terms of progress, where are we since 2010? So these are two very recent reports from the CDC, one just a few weeks ago. What we can see is between 2010 and 2015, and there's a, a lag in data, a modest increase in viral suppression. So roughly a 10% increase in viral suppression, a modest reduction in the number of new cases, so about a 15% reduction in new cases through 2016. Um, this report just came out on the right side, looking at mortality, more success there. So an overall decline in the death rate by 37%, but HIV-related deaths decreasing by about 50%. So in a 10-year period, a, a pretty profound reduction in HIV-related deaths and something absolutely to celebrate and I think a function of having a strategy, having a plan, having focused resources, having all those things I talked about with the HIV exceptionalism that really have made this possible. So here's where we are now. Incredibly ambitious goals, a reduction by 75% by 2025, by 90% by 2030. Uh, we've got you know, uh, margins to improve upon for testing, to get to the target for prevention, you know, substantial gap and for treatment, substantial gap to achieve viral suppression, but clearly have made progress as we launch on this new plan of ending the HIV epidemic, which very much builds upon the previous plans and the decade of work. So I was now gonna focus on some of the work we've done in Alabama, just to give some context and some of the, the perspectives on the ground. Um, and so Birmingham Unite. So one of my jobs is to make the acronyms. Most of them are terrible. This one was actually, I think, pretty good. So Birmingham Unite was going to be a unified network to integrate testing and engagement. And this is about 2010. And we had this vision of having a health information exchange so that we said we had our, our clinics and then there was um, aid service organizations, community based organizations, as well as the health department, all sending client level data to CDC and to HRSA, but not using those data on the ground and having the anecdotal experience for me of saying, I haven't seen someone as their provider in a year, yet they've gone to Birmingham AIDS Outreach BAO every month to get help with their utility bill or a food box. And there's not that connection to say, here's someone who is not being seen, not in medical care, but receiving supportive services. So we put in a grant to have these data go to the health department, um, you know, thinking about privacy, confidentiality, and, and all the ethical issues. Um, and then we would have an exchange to be able to really better understand where there's gaps in treatment 
across these agencies and try to have more continuous care. An important lesson, this grant wasn't funded. So it was an idea, it wasn't funded, but I think gave us a platform in thinking about things differently than we've done things in the past. So a few years later, we convened a community dialogue. This is our first Ending AIDS in Alabama dialogue, our Center for AIDS Research, along with the National Minority AIDS Council. Council. A very good day, good discussion, but at the end of the meeting, one of our community partners said, you know, we've got to start doing things different. Like we've got to, we can't keep coming together and having these feel good moments. We've got to do things differently. So we've got to make Unite a reality. And we need an Alabama cascade. So at this time we didn't have one, the Gardner cascade was out there for national, a bunch of states had done it. So this was our real call to action was, we've got to make Unite a reality. We've got to have our own Alabama cascade. <clears throat> so the next year we had our first treatment cascade. Equally, it looked very similar to national estimates, similar challenges in terms of, you know, access to care, under testing and low levels of viral suppression. And we came together uh, actually in March of 2013. This is a photo from a few years later in, just, uh, in August with several of the key uh, partners, but came together in March of 2013 to form the Jefferson County HIV AIDS Community Coalition. So you can see AIDS Alabama, Birmingham AIDS Outreach to community based organizations along with Alethea House. The Jefferson County Local Health Department, the State Health Department, our UAB 1917 Clinic, the Center for AIDS Research. So all these agencies had worked together for a lot of years, shared clients, had gone last minute for letters of support for grants and things, um, and came together and said, we've got to do things differently. And at the first meeting we had, there was a lot of finger pointing, a lot of he said, she said, you did, you know, they did. And, you know, we all kind of stopped and our mantra was, we've got to turn the page. That is 2013. <laughs> Our cascade looks as terrible as everybody else. We got to get past the way things have been and look to the future and turn the page. And came up with some shared goals to improve health outcomes, enhance prevention, treatment, research, to focus on social economic justice, community collaboration, and look for sustainability. And then this was very grounding. So in the future, when opportunities came up, we had a foundation that brought us together. And this group has met monthly, um, not by mandate, but by desire, has met monthly um, um, you know, ever since 2013. So this photo, one of the successes of this group was these frontline provider meetings, bringing together the, the social workers, linkage coordinators, outreach workers, folks who would say, we've talk, talked on the phone to each other for, for years and years, but to come together in shared space and kind of you know, convene and discuss and, and work together, um, also, a number of grant opportunities, and I'll talk first about this BCHIP, this Birmingham Comprehensive High Impact Prevention, because this was two years into the coalition and the first real challenge that we faced. So CDC put out a prevention grant, 15-1502, and in their wisdom said if a single agency goes in, the max amount was 450K a year. If a coalition of agencies went in, it was 850 a year. And it had to go to a community based organization, universities, health departments were not eligible. So we had the meeting to determine who would be the lead agency. And it was really interesting because historically the attendance at the coalition meetings, which also include, you know, um, five consumers, five advocates and two members of each agency were the prevention director or, you know, other folks of that nature. Now, for the first time, we had all the executive directors at the table and there was a lot of angling and lobbying about who was going to be the lead agency and could we go in for this together? And things were getting kind of heated um, and a lot of the old he said, she said, they said coming up. And it was really powerful because someone living with HIV, one of the consumers um, kind of jumped into it, this heated discussion and said, you know, for the last two years, I thought we were different. You know, I'd heard that historically it was all about the money and all the agencies cared about was the money. And I thought we were different, but we're not. And it was incredibly powerful and I can't do it justice. And from that, it was like a pin drop and everyone came together, decided BAO, the smallest of the agencies would be the lead agency. They would go in as a coalition and not compete um, and that everyone would be supported. And this was funded and really kind of launched the era of success of collaboration, followed up with a second grant through the Department of Health through this game changer, but a really powerful moment in terms of building this coalition. So in 2020, you know, Unite looks more like this, a lot of new partners. We don't have a health information exchange yet, but we do have a universal release. So there's better data sharing across agency with clients permission to better track service delivery, better address gaps in care, better integration of services. 
And I think we're all proud, you know, we can't say causally, but that there's been a 25% reduction in new HIV cases in Jefferson County over this 2013 to 2017 period, while statewide the new infection rates stayed flat. So, um, you know, some credit to coming together as a coalition around a shared vision and achieving these goals. And then for our Center for AIDS Research, launching an ending HIV in Alabama scientific working group. So the status neutral continuum really orienting us around these different pillars of diagnose, prevent, and treat, a broad portfolio of funding, but very much aligned on these pillars on this status neutral continuum. And just gonna share some of the work that's ongoing and some of the work that's being done. So a very broad portfolio in prevention and it's community engaged prep research, a number of investigators, projects, Critically, community partners. None of this work can we do without, you know, activated, engaged community partners. Many times they are leading the project. Sometimes we are leading the project, but all of our work um, critically engages with community partners as well as with the public health department. I want to share from Leticia Alopre. So Leticia is on a K23, also a Robert Wood Johnson AMFDP award recipient. One of her studies around prevention, looking at prep, prefer prep preferences among African American women in rural Alabama. So, prep uptake has been highest among men who have sex with men, very low among women, particularly in rural areas. So, this is the state of Alabama. Um, the heat map, you know, the darker area is the prevalence of HIV. Um, the red star is Jefferson County, where Birmingham is. The, the white box is where Montgomery uh, Medical Advocacy and Outreach around Montgomery are our key clinical partners. And Leticia partnered with MAO to go into four rural counties in Alabama to engage women, talk with them about PrEP and their thoughts about PrEP and their preferences using a discrete choice experiment to get a sense of would you want PrEP? And if so, where would you want it and how would you want it? So in this, this uh, uh, graph, you see the red are women who said, I would not want PrEP. The green are women who said, I would be open to it. And the blue are women who said, you know, I would be interested in PrEP. And what Leticia found in her discrete choice experiment, giving people different options of preference, was that women overwhelmingly wanted it um, if they were to get PrEP in their doctor's office or maybe in a family planning office, did not want pharmacy-based PrEP, did not want it in an STD clinic. Um, also very interesting, women wanted either a long-acting shot or a pill, felt strongly, did not want an implant and did not want a vaginal ring. So there were some vaginal preparations, but the preference was a, a long-acting shot or a pill for prevention. And with, she's now taking this work forward, to developing interventions to make PrEP more accessible to women. This is Lynn Matthews. Um, so Lynn Matthews, uh, an early stage investigator, got a CFAR supplement looking at diagnose, so data-driven community testing, also working in South Alabama. The heat map shows cold spots, so the lighter areas are where the rates of testing are lower. The red and yellow around the counties is where the prevalence is the highest. So in some of our most poor rural communities in South Alabama, identifying areas where testing is low but rates of infection are high to do community engagement, stakeholder interviews, to think about mobile testing, outreach, and think about how can we use data to inform where we should go to do more testing, but also to deliver testing and prevention me messages that are uh, lower um, in terms of promoting stigma, reducing stigma. So next, thinking about diagnosis, test and treat, so the time to viral suppression. So this is a study we did with colleagues at uh, CDC, Irene Hall, who leads the CDC uh, surveillance branch. We talked about CDC captures diagnosis date and viral suppression on the cascade. We could look at the time between those key events and as a marker of how well we are doing. And what we found in 2019 was the overall median time from diagnosis to viral suppression was 19 months, so quite a long time. Uh, for folks who got linked to care within three months was better, and for individuals who had a low CD4 count, even better. So more quick therapy, but quite a long time. I mean, a year and a half overall for persons following diagnosis to achieve viral suppression and put out there that this really should be an indicator that anchors the, the continuum and could be a population health surveillance measure to help guide therapy. Uh, the next study we did was looking at Alabama, trying to get a sense for the time to viral suppression over time and by geography. So this is our state divided into 11 public health areas. And the first thing that we looked at was over time. And I think, you know, very positively, the median time to from diagnosis to viral suppression decreased from 10 months down to six months between 2012 and 2014. 
So that was a real positive. Um, what was really striking was how much geographic variability there was. So public health areas three, four, and five, right across the middle of the state, depending on where you lived, it might be as short as seven months or as long as 13 months to achieve viral suppression. Even more dramatic down in the south part of our state, areas nine, 10, and 11, where it might be as short as six or as long as 13 months. So really raising the question of, why is there so much geographic variability in the time from diagnosis to viral suppression? And my colleagues, Dr. Adi Arana and Scott Beatty, getting an R01 study funded to ask that and working collaboratively with health departments in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana to look statewide at trends in diagnosis and suppression by geography using GIS, but then going to do in-depth interviews with public health, community, and clinical partners to really understand the factors driving faster or slower time to suppression to help develop and deploy public health clinical community rapid treatment protocols. How do we really, from diagnosis, get folks into therapy, learning from areas that are doing better and helping the areas that are not quite doing as well and understanding those challenges? These are very hot off the press data. So this is looking at between 2012 and 2015 across these three states. In the legend, the, the, the darker green indicates a longer median time to viral suppression. So you can see, most of the public health areas in the three states, the median time to suppression was more than 270 days between 2012 and 2015. And I think remarkably seeing the progress in 2018 and 2019, you know, many now getting to within 60 to 90 days and others, you know, less than 180 days. So I think remarkable temporal progress, but still some geographic variability and the work to understand why some areas doing better than others will really help inform those areas that aren't doing as well in terms of strategies to promote more rapid viral suppression. We'll note that Louisiana is the only state of these three to expand Medicaid um, and was the state that did have the greatest impact in their time to suppression. So also thinking about TREAT, I um, wanna talk about missed visits. So a lot of my work, as Jim alluded to, is around engagement and care. And this idea of no-show visits, and this was a study born out of a nurse practitioner saying a lot of our patients miss visits and looked at uh, 500 individuals initiating care at our clinic and asked the simple question of, was a missed visit in the first year associated with increased mortality? And lo and behold, there was a three-fold increased mortality risk in persons who missed the visit in the first year versus those who attended all their visits, adjusting for other factors. And the take-home message from this you know, was that the missed visits are not causally responsible for the long-term mortality. But for us as doctors, nurses, social workers, linkage coordinators, what a powerful indicator. Someone who is missing a visit in the first year is indicating to us that whether it's social, structural factors, stigma, you know, there's something that is placing this person at higher risk that needs to, to, to be paid attention to and needs a deeper dive. Since then, a number of studies looking at missed visits showing associations with delayed treatment, poor retention, longer time to viral suppression, the idea of viremia copy years, disparities, more uh, hospitalization mortality. So the idea that as clinics, we uniquely captured missed visits and an indicator to act upon to try to keep folks in care and sustain suppression. Um, the quality group, so this is a group I mentioned earlier, HRSA requires quality improvement the stars are all of the different Ryan White clinics, nine of them around the state. The circles indicate satellite, either satellite clinics or telehealth clinics associated with these different Ryan White clinics. But this group has been meeting um, quarterly for over a decade, focusing on quality improvement and looking at aggregate data, not individual data, looking to use standards to improve research. And this group, despite being built upon quality, has been open to and increasingly a platform for um, hybrid effectiveness and implementation science studies. So the most recent study, we were funded through CDC, what we call Data for Care Alabama. So now we're getting individual level data. So in this table from over 8,000 individuals from seven clinics and stratifying based upon how many visits were missed in the previous year, zero, one to two or three or more. And what we know from a number of studies is past behavior predicts future behavior. So persons who have missed visits in the past are more likely to miss in the future. So now we're trying to proactively identify roughly half of the clinic hasn't missed a visit or probably will do okay on their own. We leave them alone. The others, we deploy the intervention, which is enhanced personal context. Don't have time to go into the details, but you know, an intervention that then is deployed to try to help make sure someone doesn't miss that visit. And if they do to call right away to keep them in care. 
But this huge transition from aggregate data to now individual level data and using those data for quality improvement, for intervention to guide our clinical and public health programs. So now I'm going to come down to the closing and kind of, you know, have shared the overall picture of EHE uh, nationally and the origins, some of the work we've done in Alabama, and really put out the question of, you know, are there things, lessons learned that might be a paradigm for population health for other diseases? You know, is it unique because of the urgency around HIV in the 80s and 90s, um, or, or are there common themes that might apply to other chronic diseases? And again, uh, contemporaneously looking at COVID-19 as a case study. So in preparing this talk and thinking about what's, you know, the, the platform or the paradigm that has made ending the HIV epidemic work, I would say the first thing I hope came through clearly is there's been a federal government prioritization, a national plan and consistency. Um, going back to Obama, Crowley, you know, Brooks through, through Trump and HHS, consistency in terms of having a plan, this is a priority and the message staying the same. I think also the idea of health and human services interagency coordination and collaboration, which isn't always the case, but working on the same page with the same playbook defined by the national plan. This idea of individual level data driven clinical and public health program delivery. So whether it's time to viral suppression using surveillance data, whether it's the, the clinic data for missed visits, really having individual level data at the clinic and public health level to guide programs and guide evaluation, understanding a lot of questions about individual liberties, ethics. So again, recognize this, there's a lot that comes with this and we'll be happy to discuss as time allows in the q and I think the status neutral framework, again, there's nothing unique to this about HIV, but testing is a gateway for anything. Testing in and of itself is insufficient. If we're testing, can we funnel folks into either prevention programs to avoid um, acquiring a certain condition or to a treatment to make sure we manage it effectively and optimally? Um, having a robust research infrastructure, so having an infrastructure in place so that we can do the studies that come up, but also targeted funding opportunities. So many of the studies that I mentioned were NIH or CDC funded opportunities that were ending the HIV epidemic funding. They had to be aligned with the plan and with the strategy. So the funding opportunities mirror the national plan and help towards these national goals. And I think all ultimately all health is local, all healthcare is local. So triangulation of community, clinical and public health partners on the ground ultimately is essential to get the work done and achieve the larger vision. So applying to COVID-19, you know, and I, I won't belabor this, but I would say we have not had good prioritization consistency. There's not been a national plan and really have not had the kind of interagency coordination that we saw around HIV. Again, going back to March 2019, having Azar and the leaders of every agency there on the same play with the same playbook talking about HIV, unfortunately has not been the case, you know, for COVID. On the flip side, I can't think of a time. It's amazing how much real time data we've had. And so there's many different websites, many different places to get this data. But to have real time data about COVID diagnoses, hospitalization, mortality, down to the county level and even within counties, to be able to help us think through where are the hot spots and to guide therapy is just remarkable. And I think. Hopefully some of the lessons learned in, in doing this with COVID, we can take forward with us in thinking about public health programming for HIV and other non-communicable diseases going forward. In terms of robust research funding, so NIH has launched an incredibly bold initiative. I mean, NIH, to their credit, a lot of times isn't structured to do things in a nimble and dynamic way, but put forth the rapid acceleration of diagnostics, the RADx program, a 1.5 billion program going from tech to develop new diagnostics to community engaged studies. One component is RADx up or RADx for underserved populations, which seeks to build a consortium of community engaged projects to deploy strategies to improve the reach, uptake, and sustainability of testing. 
So this idea of a very coordinated plan to link together, um, building upon existing centers. So these went to existing CTSAs, any number of centers was eligible, but you had to have that center infrastructure to do uh, apply for and get one of these RADx grants. We were fortunate through our CFAR to get one, uh, to get one of these grants, building upon our relationship statewide and the work we'd done and called COVID Comet uh, AL. So community engaged testing in Alabama, it's two years of funding, incredibly ambitious, but working with community partners to do 36,000 COVID tests in six rural counties. This will more than double the current testing. Uh, we've done this uh, with an ADAPT framework for assessment, preparation, implementation. And the goal is to really support and bolster the on the ground efforts. And we've done some listening sessions, You know, need more test kits, need PPE, need personnel, but also to infuse peer health advocates, community health workers, and additional venue based testing responsive to the needs of the communities on the ground in these rural areas. And so coming back to data driven public health programming. So this, this idea of using our data to guide our, our plan. So Lynn Matthews, who had done some incredible work around the HIV data to guide testing, as I mentioned, has led this effort to look statewide at a number of different metrics and say, where are the counties that we should prioritize to start doing our outreach and testing? and came up with a number of different um, you know, indices. And it turned out that a county Franklin in the Northwest, Clay Central and East and Clark in the Southwest are the three counties we were gonna start and do our testing. But doing this and choosing this based upon on data. So using data to guide our public health programming and delivery. And then ultimately we're gonna have local triangulation. So we've engaged with our community clinic and public health partners. So assessment was to identify where are we gonna go Preparation is doing in-depth interviews and surveys to get the sense of where are folks at and they're thinking about masking, mitigation, what's even possible based upon the demands of work and school and, and whatnot. So to think about our tailored messages to help with harm reduction, people make decisions within the, the, the realities of their life to protect themselves, their families, their community, and then to launch the implementation phase, which is to go with our community partners, the quality group and AHEC, and do testing with community health workers and with peers. So want to acknowledge it's a gigantic team on the COVID Comet project, also a very large team on ending the HIV epidemic. So I've chosen pictures and, and logos instead of names because there's really too many individuals to, to name um, individually. Um, and I also want to take a moment to acknowledge, you know, in World AIDS Days, those that we've lost and we continue to lose and we continue to lose too many folks to uh, a, an infection, to a disease that is manageable. And a lot of it comes down to structural factors and social drivers that are fueling and I think are getting more attention and require more attention and urgency. So we have the biomedical tools, but really thinking about the structural and social factors that are fueling and driving um, the ongoing HIV epidemic are critical for us. And, and by no means are they unique to HIV. These same factors are fueling disparate outcomes and inequities around you know, a myriad um, chronic diseases. So with that, we'll come back to, I think the question mark, you know, are these lessons learned? Do they resonate? The idea of these different bullet points as a paradigm for pop health, you know, is HIV so unique or COVID so unique because of the urgency that it doesn't apply to diabetes or hypertension? I will say my wife is an internist and does diabetes research, and we've talked for a good while about you know, what is unique or not unique? Why isn't there a national plan or a national, you know, a group of the, advising the president about diabetes? You know, what is the coordination collaboration? But again, we'll put out there, um, might some of these uh, steps or some of these elements that have really, I think, in my estimation, made for successful delivery and programming for HIV to make aspirational goals like ending HIV, something we can try to achieve, might they apply some of them or all of them in thinking about other areas in medicine um, beyond HIV, COVID and infectious conditions? And with that, uh, again, want to thank you for, for um, attending and for the invitation. I really wish I could be there in person. Really challenging to do this virtually, but um, thankful for the opportunity. And if you have some time, would love to engage in some questions. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, a, a wonderful overview and 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 optimistic uh, a, a story of success. And I will be thinking about it. Every generation of physicians has a scourge that that impacts their uh, 
their how they think about medicine. And I think our current trainees, um, it's going to be COVID. For me, it was it's the HIV epidemic as a pulmonary fellow at San Francisco General in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, I mean, this is what I lived. Um, and I also think it's really important to realize it took years before we had federal government prioritization, before the president would even mention AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, th I think the question is, how do you accelerate um, that process from identification to getting to this paradigm? Um, and uh, even your community engagement took years of building trust to mm -hmm. get to the point where you can um, coordinate care. You want to comment a little bit on that? Yeah, no, I think great points and the perspective from from San Francisco general back in those days is, is very well taken and, and also just the climate and how much effort it took. Um, you know, I think certain pieces are in place and certain things do take time. I think there is a critical role for advocacy and not advocacy from us as the medical community, but advocacy for the general public and. I think we have some examples where you see some advocacy lead to, and if it's not with the federal government, maybe it's with foundations and building things. So you know, I think about things like um, type one diabetes and children and just how much advocacy there is and how much resources or for other rare conditions and you see foundations. So I think a critical element of the prioritization, you know, I think beyond us is the medical community and working with our public health leaders and, you know, going and, as we all do, talking with our elected officials at the state and federal level, I think mobilizing and giving voice to our communities becomes a, a critically important piece of this. And I think your points are well taken. It does take time and will take time. But in, in my estimation, absent those strong, powerful community voices, you know, early on ACT UP <laughs> and the groups in New York and elsewhere around HIV, you know, later on other groups and, and, and but absent those voices, I don't know that it can get to that level. Even with the, those voices, I think it's hard to get there. But I think community advocacy and demanding the attention is, is essential and does take time and, cons and, and effort. Great. Um, and there's a question from Christy Bartles. Um, thanking you for an outstanding presentation and an incredible public health program. Uh, who's been doing using the same HIV continuum in lupus. Um, and wanted to know more about your experience with the community and public service partnerships, particularly for low socioeconomic status patients. Yeah, so in, in terms of the partnerships, um, and I'm not sure if there's anything more specific, but I will say that the key approach I will say, you know, th that we took was in our partnerships and it went back to that coalition. I think the history was one of agencies going to other agencies last minute asking for a letter of support, asking for those kind of things. And so, you know, I, I started inviting myself to agencies and saying, can I come spend a half a day? Can I just I want to see your workflow. I want to meet your staff. I want to meet your folks. So I think some of the approach and not just me, a whole team of us was built, like, as you mentioned, building that trust and engaging with community partners around. I'm not here to ask you about a project. I'm not asking you to sign on to something. You know, let's think about where our shared goals and vision are. So I've really tried to build these coalitions around shared goals, shared interests, mutual trust, mutual respect. Um, and very much our community partners, a lot of our work um, is centered on just addressing the incredible disparities and inequities that exist. So I'm not sure if that answered the question adequately, but I think the point of building relationships that are about the relationships and not about, you know, the, the specific grant or project or program or pet pet interest of any, you know, one person um, at either on either you know end of the age of the relationship. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interpret that as saying, don't wait for the RFA to come out, start building a relationship. So when the RFA comes out, it's not that last minute asking for exactly. that letter. Yes. Um, I, I also have a question yeah. about the impact of COVID on the um, care in the, H, in the HIV community. Uh, yeah. What has been the impact? And the second part of that is, where do you see the um, incorporation of telemedicine and digital health technologies in the continuum and um, in, in uh, uh, some of these pillars. Yeah, no, thank you. I think um, 
So I think in many ways, COVID has further accentuated some of our disparities and inequities. Um, so I think folks that were struggling, you know, and on the margins are struggling even more to stay in care and stay on treatment. And folks that are doing well have been able to adopt and have resources in terms of making telehealth a, a better option. So, um, you know, I, I think in many ways, COVID has exaggerated um, the disparities that exist. Um, in terms of the telehealth, you know, I'll say I've been amazed at how our agencies have been able to, you know, even with remote doing, I mean, obviously doing drive through testing for HIV, but have been able to adapt and still offer services. It's been remarkable to witness a lot of our community partners and agencies. I do think, you know, the role for telehealth, I will say a number of patients in our clinic, I think, are, are interested in continuing this. So a number of folks have talked about, you know, can I come in and see you once a year? and then do a telehealth visit in between. So, I, you know, I, I don't, I suspect for HIV outpatient cares with other care, I, that telehealth beyond being a modality to reach folks in remote rural areas might become more a part of our um, regular uh, care. But I'm curious to see how it evolves um, post COVID. Okay. Um, there's a question and I apologize for um, mispronouncing the name. Kaboto Gravier for um, uh, prophylaxis. Cabotegravir. Cabotegravir. Yeah. So yeah. So cabotegravir is, uh, is is an injection. So you know we have a lot of folks with pill fatigue. Um, so cabotegravir. So this, the HPTN that trials network did a study showing the efficacy of this injectable medication, cabotegravir. So now for prevention purposes, instead of having to take a pill every day, you know, I don't believe it's gone down the route of FDA approval yet, but increasing the choices and the, and the ways that delivery of pre-exposure prophylaxis. So antiretrovirals now being available possibly by injection, both for prevention and treatment. But you know, I mean, going back to Letitia's work, Really, it's now more about what are patients' preferences and choice. It's amazing from where we had these incredibly toxic therapies taken multiple times a day with terrible side effects to now talking about safety, convenience, you know, and those things. But cabotegravir, I think, is going to be a game changer in terms of giving people more options um, for having injectable and not needing to be a pill-based therapy. Well, thank you. And we're. Uh, I will ask Jim if he has one last comment to make. Um, just about out of time. You know, thank you. This is really great and inspiring and hopeful. And, uh, you know, because that other virus is is sapping up a lot of our energy. But thank you yeah. very much, Mike, for this great presentation. Oh, thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful okay. presentation. And thank you all for uh, coming by. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Mike, be well. Uh, that was great. Superb.